First Peter chapter 4. Begin reading in verse number 12. The Bible says, Beloved, he's talking to the saved folks, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice. I've got to be honest, I haven't rejoiced in any of this. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached, that word reproach means scolded. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing, as unto a faithful creator. Here we find Peter is dealing with Christians and their sufferings. And my dear friends, uh, uh, it's no stretch of imagination. This has been an attack on the church. It's been an attack on God's people. And God's people are suffering like we've never suffered before. When our very constitutional and biblical rights have been attacked and we're told how and how we cannot worship, my dear friends, it's caused suffering. I want you to notice how Peter expounds on suffering. I want you to notice, first of all, the severity of suffering. He deals with the severity of suffering. Verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Peter didn't say you're going to have a, a, a little bit of trouble. He said a fiery trial trial. He's dealing with severe suffering. I never would have thought there'd be a day in America when uh, elected officials would tell us that we could not assemble and worship the Lord. Uh, uh, this is a fiery trial. Uh, this has weighed heavy on my heart and many of your hearts. Uh, 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 the, uh, here the politicians say that church is not essential. They don't know uh, how we feel about church. They don't know uh, how we feel about the Bible. They don't know how we feel about the Lord. Uh, uh, I realize there are some people that uh, uh, their church life is just an activity. It's just an obligation. Uh, but those of us that are blood washed, uh, those of us that have been begotten by the Son of God and born again, uh, those of us uh, uh, that realize this is more than just an occasion, uh, this, my dear friends, is a lifestyle uh, and uh, uh, if we do not have uh, 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 the ability to worship as dictated by the Bible, uh, uh, we lose all sense of who we are. It's severe suffering. And he says, think it not strange if we face a fiery trial. He says, as though some strange thing happened unto you. How many times have you heard it quoted that they that live godly shall suffer persecution? But you see, when you're not suffering persecution, when you've never suffered persecution, when you've never really faced an obstacle to coming to church, that just rolls in one ear and out the other. But my dear friends, when you're in the midst of it, Peter says, don't think it's some strange thing. Can I say what has befallen us is not new. As Jordan taught Sunday, there's nothing new under the sun. And can I say Christians have been persecuted for 2,000 years. You didn't think we was going to get to go to heaven without suffering some, did you? He says, don't think it a strange thing. But yeah, it's a fiery trial. Yes, the suffering is severe. 
but don't think it a strange thing. He expounds on the severity of suffering. It is a fiery trial. Uh, and it'll fire you up the more you think about it. We want to say, bless God, let's go to church. But at what cost? My dear friends, we see he expounds on the severity of suffering. Can I say, secondly, he, he expounds on one's spirit during suffering. How are we to respond? How are we to act? Verse 13, he says, But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. And on their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Can I say, when President Obama was in office, he mocked us, those that had the audacity to carry a Bible and believe in God. Hillary referred to us as deplorable, the offscour of the world. Can I say, they say we're non-essential. We don't matter. Uh, what we do doesn't even count. Uh, 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 my dear friends, our spirit, uh, we should rejoice. Uh, we should be happy. Uh, can I say, they said Jesus didn't matter. Uh, they said he didn't count. Uh, even when Pilate said, I find no fault in him, they cried the more, crucify him, uh, crucify him. Uh, friend, uh, uh, we are being identified with Christ like never before uh, because they... Uh, Count us as worthless like they did him. And they, they're speaking evil of us. But God's looking down. And he said, just keep living for me. It'll be all right. We see our spirit should be that we, re we should rejoice and be happy that they are truly identifying us with Christ. We truly are being noted for what we are. How many times have you heard folks stand up and testify, I'm nothing, I'm not worthy to even call on his name. Uh, 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 the psalmist said, uh, what is man that thou visits him? We are nothing, and we're being told that today. But hey, that's what they said about him. That he don't matter. We see one spirit during suffering. He also expounds on self-inflicted suffering. Look what he says in verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in another man's matters. The Lord says it's one thing when people do you wrong, for my name's sake. You ought to rejoice in that. But, he said, don't become self-inflicted in suffering. If you're a murderer, yeah, you're going to jail, but you're not going to jail on Christ's behalf. Don't become a murderer. Don't become, my dear friends, a thief. Don't become an evildoer, and don't become a busybody into somebody else's matters. He said, all of that you're bringing on yourself. When you uh, take uh, hold of those things, oh, you're going to suffer, but not for Christ's sake. He said, don't become that kind of sufferer, self-inflicted. You're to always conduct yourself as Christ would. Notice he deals with also shining forth in suffering. Look at verse 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. He said, if you are called to suffer, don't be ashamed of it. Don't be ashamed that you're suffering. Glorify the Lord. And that's what we should do. We should shine forth. We should let people see, even though they discount us, Christ doesn't. And we should let folks know who we love and who we serve and whose we are. Shine forth as a Christian. Glorify God on this behalf. But then he deals with the season of suffering in verse 17. For the time is come. Didn't say the time had passed. Didn't say the time will come. The time is come. Can I say the Bible's always up to date? And for generations, whenever somebody read, read this, there's always been somebody suffering. 
Well, it's very prevalent in our day right now and in our lives right now. For the time is come. It is the season of suffering. What time has come? That judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? For years, preachers have said, if revival is going to come, it's going to come through the church. And it will. Well, it wasn't going to come through the church what the church had become. God had to shut things down to where people would appreciate church again. The season of suffering is right now. My fear is this. While this is happening, there are some, it is creating an appetite that they can't wait to get back to church. But there are also others out there who are drying up on the vine. The longer they go without church, the less interested they are in church. I'd like to say that every member of our church has been tuning in these live stream services, but that's not true. There's some that don't have internet access, and there's some that have it, and they just don't choose to tune in. And can I say, as I said early on, you've got to be very careful when it's church time to treat it as church time. Because when you're sitting in your living room, it's very easy to get distracted. Very easy for the phone to go off. Very easy to be on your phone checking out other things. Uh, uh, very easy to want to get up and go to the refrigerator, make a sandwich. All kinds of things will distract you while you're sitting at home. And can I say, a lot of people have gotten distracted enough to where... It's not that important to them anymore. The real danger of this live streaming, there are going to be folks who get used to not having to come to church and they can just tune it in whenever they want to. Can I say, we started the live streaming ministry for those that couldn't come to church. Those that are shut in. Those that have no access. Those that uh, their health does not allow them to come. But unfortunately, as we're seeing all across the country in these feel-good churches, it becomes a lifestyle. People will just take this as their church. Never lose sight of the scriptures that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That's what live stream cannot do. And as far as the governors and everybody else that says as long as we've got live stream, they're not discriminating against us, the truth of the matter is if God wanted to use the airwaves for to the establishment of his church he'd have just chose to write the gospel in the sky no he chose the local called out assembly and judgment must begin at the house of God notice the sobriety of real suffering mentioned in verse number 18 and if the righteous scarcely be saved where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear my dear friends, what we are going through is light affliction compared to what they're going to go through in hell. The reason we need to stay Christian, the reason that we need revival, the reason we need to pay attention during these days and to reflect uh, and take uh, uh, self-inventory and the reason we need to get back to the Bible, the reason we need to get back on our knees. Uh, uh, my dear friends, if we don't get full of God during these days, uh, uh, the tragedy is uh, there are many going to die of something worse than COVID-19. They're going to die of sin and they're going to spend eternity in hell. Uh, that's the sober message of suffering. What we're going through is nothing compared to what they'll go through for all of eternity. And then we find that he expounds on submission to God in our suffering. Look what he says in verse number 19. Wherefore, let him that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. My dear friends, what we've been going through did not catch God by surprise. And I'm not so certain that God not only allowed it, God may have desired it so that you and I would take God more seriously. But the Bible makes it clear that when we are suffering uh, according to the will of God that we are to commit or submit ourselves uh, to God for the keeping of our souls to Him and well-doing as a faithful creator. I want to tell you something. In the midst of our 
frustration, in the midst of our stress, in the midst of the uncertainty. Uh, can I say, God's still on the throne. And we need to submit to Him all of our stress, all of our frustration, all of our anxiety, all of our fear, all of our anguish. He said, casting all your cares upon Him, for He careth for you. And when we'll do that, my dear friends, we'll then get the peace that passes all understanding in the midst of our suffering. Well, I'm interested in verse 17. I've read this verse, I've referred to this verse many times throughout the last three decades in preaching. But I'm interested um, because it is so sober for the moment. It says, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Now, I want to preach on this topic tonight. Judgment that leads to revival. Judgment that leads to revival. I want to say something tonight. God did not allow this to happen for us to stay in a complacent state. God did not allow this to happen to drive us away. God allowed this to come into our lives that we would quit looking around and we would truly look up and start basing our life upon Him. That we would once again, or maybe for the first time ever, put Him first in our lives, uh, uh, that He might truly send what this world really needs, and that is a true spiritual revival. Can I say? True revival will begin in the house of God, and it will come about by God judging His people's worthiness for it. God hasn't sent revival in a hundred years because God's people haven't been worthy of it. God does not waste time or energy on folks that do not desire Him. God is looking for our worthiness of revival, and the only way we'll ever be found worthy is if He judges us and deems us worthy. Do you do realize that we'll go to the judgment seat of Christ and we'll give an account of the deeds done in this body after we were saved, whether they were good or evil, and we'll be judged. And after we've been judged by fire, then we'll get the wedding garment because we'll be deemed worthy to don the wedding garment. And can I say, when it comes to being in a position where we can put on the garment of revival, we must be deemed worthy of it, and the worthiness will come through the judgment of God and how God chooses to judge His people. Again, judgment that leads to revival. I know judgment isn't a popular message. That's why I'm preaching with only a few people in the building, huh? But it's still true. And this message may be the very message that it takes to bring real revival to our land. You'll either embrace it, apply it to your life, or you'll go on spinning out of, it, out of control in your life and wondering why God doesn't help you. God is trying to help you. He's trying to do something impactful in your life. He's trying to do something for you you can't even dream of, and that is send a true supernatural revival. Can I say, first of all, God will judge His people through purging. Through purging. Throughout the Bible... And even in the future, in the great tribulation, when Israel will be judged, they'll be purged. God has a way of bringing revival to His people, and it always comes through purging. Can I say that God will purge His people of their defilement, their sin? God is angry with the wicked every day, but God is frustrated with His people when they have sin in their life because it hinders their fellowship and their walk with Him. Uh, can I say worry is a sin? Can I say uh, 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 being uh, complacent where we are is a sin? Can I say uh, 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 put, not putting God first is a sin? Uh, uh, we don't have to preach on lying. We don't have to preach on thieving, even though a lot of people don't, uh, uh, they'll rob God, not be honest with God there. We don't have to uh, preach on on murder. We don't have to preach on a lot of things. Uh, all we got to do is preach on people where they are spiritually uh, and a lot of folks have gotten content, uh, complacent, uh, 
taking for granted the house of God, taking for granted the grace of God, taking for granted the word of God, taking for granted the mercy and blood of Jesus Christ, taking for granted the man of God, taking for granted the, uh, the facilities of God. We just uh, uh, got to where we'd come in, uh, expect to be here, expect the preacher to have a message, expect God to show up, uh, and God said enough of that, uh, and God is trying to purge his people uh, of their defiance to where they'll hunger and thirst for righteousness again where they'll hunger and thirst for the word of God again where they'll get to where uh, their prayer life in the shopping list asking God for everything but their prayer life is uh, God we just need you uh, where folks will once again appreciate the liberty of coming and worshiping his holy name uh, he'll purge people of their defilement now don't get me wrong. There are people sitting in the pews that aren't right with God. They've got sin in their life. They've got a lustful spirit. They've got a lustful eye. There are folks sitting in the house of God that are fornicators and adulterers. There are folks sitting in the house of God that haven't opened their Bible and read their Bible. They don't pray. They don't pay their tithes. They don't witness. And their testimony in this world is nothing but mud. And I'm telling you, God's fed up with it. So he shut the spout off so he could purge his people. And purge them of their defilement. Not only that, he'll purge them of their desires. I noticed it. I've noticed it for years. You listen to people talk in the vestibule, they'll talk about everything but God. Uh, if Tiger's wearing a red shirt on Sunday, they're interested in what Tiger's doing on the golf course. They'll even keep up with the score while service is going on. Hey, if the Bengals are actually going to win a football game, which is a rare feat, uh, 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 they're checking the scores. Uh, what church is going on? Uh, hey, if the Reds uh, 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 will ever get in playoff contention, and I've seen them, they'll sit there and check the ball scores. Uh, they're interested in their Facebook accounts while they're in the house of God, uh, and they've degraded the house of God. Their desires for worldly things, uh, their desires for non-spiritual things, uh, and God's fed up with it, uh, and he's going to purge his people uh, of their desires for worldly things until their desires are heavenly things you want this thing opened up you start desiring him when you desire sports to take off again you start desiring him more than you desire uh, 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 your favorite restaurant to open up again you start desiring him more than anything else yeah, the house of God will open up and I say he will purge his people of their defilement of their desires and he'll purge the church of driftwood I don't know if you've ever been to the river. Every river looks muddy and it's got, they're full of driftwood just going down the river. Useless. Good for nothing. It's in the river, but it's good for nothing. Can I say there are a lot of people sitting in churches that in God's domain, they're good for nothing. You never hear them testify. Never see them in an altar. They don't pay their tithes. They never praise God. They never worship. They never see a tear in their eye. You never see any brokenness in their life. They get out in the community. They never tell anybody about God. They never pass out a track. They never invite anybody to church. Uh, they never do anything for God. They're just driftwood. They're taking up space. And God says, enough of that. He'll purge them of them. Now, I promise you, they keep saying, boy, there'll be a new normal. When this thing opens up, there'll be a new normal. I'm tired of hearing that. But you, will, you wait and see, there'll be some that don't come back to church because their heart wasn't in church in the first place. And God is getting his church ready for revival and he cannot revive his church with driftwood hanging around. He's going to purge it. He'll purge his church to deem them worthy of revival. Judgment that leads to revival, and God judges his people through purging. Can I say this secondly? He judges his people through pruning. Now, one thing I do around the house is I, on occasion, have to prune the hedges. Now, listen, you don't prune the hedges every day, but you've got to prune the hedges. I don't particularly do a good job of it, but you've got to prune them. And can I say, uh, you've got to have your trees cut back every now and then. You've got to have your shrubs cut back every now and then. You've got to prune them. Why? If you don't ever cut it back, it won't grow properly. And can I say, God will prune his church. Can I say, 
uh, he'll prune uh, dangerous limbs. You ever had a tree growing up near a power line? You better trim that branch off before it gets in that power line. That power line and that tr tree limb come together, and that tree limb might uh, take some electricity on that might kill the whole tree. Can I say there are some dangerous limbs in God's house and His tree? There are some that are headed toward power lines. There are some people that come to church, um, but while they're here, they're not interested in what God can do for them. They're interested in what they can do for God. And they're interested in how they can impress God's people. And they're interested in all kinds of things. The problem is, is they're about ready to tap into the wrong source. And that could not only hurt them, but it could hurt the whole body of Christ. So God tends to prune that crowd out. Because Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. But not, not only will he prune dangerous limbs, he'll prune drooping limbs. Miss Nett and I, when we walk our dog, there's one house we go by and this guy's got a weeping willow tree and he never, ever prunes those limbs. We've got to walk through it or walk around it. And it's so frustrating. Oh, but a couple years back, he actually trimmed a couple of the branches down over the sidewalk and put out a sign, sorry that I haven't done this. Well, it's been two years, and you're still sorry once you uh, prune it again. But limbs on a tree, if they droop over too far and hit the ground, uh, there's a couple of problems with that. First of all, they obstruct. Drooping limbs will obstruct the view. They'll obstruct the tree. They'll cause all kinds of problems. Uh, but not only will they obstruct, if they get too far on the down on the ground, it's going to kill them. And there are so many people that are drooping. God is sick and tired of people coming to church and whining. Can I help you something? God's been good to you. God has blessed you. He has blessed you far beyond your deserving and yet all you do is whine and complain about how bad you got it and you're obstructing people's view of God and the more you droop the deader you become God will prune some drooping branches hmm? and then I thought about this he'll also prune the dead limbs Tree's never going to grow. Bush's never going to grow when it's full of dead limbs. You've got to get rid of them. Prune it back, and it'll grow. And I say, when God's getting his church ready for revival, he'll purge it. Then he'll prune it. Can I say something else God will do? When God sends judgment at the house of God, and again, his judgment on the house of God is for their benefit. He wants to deem them worthy of revival. But when he begins judging after he prunes, he'll also publish. He'll expose some things. You know what preaching does? See, teaching imparts information. Preaching requires you to take notice and inventory with God, and he'll expose some weaknesses in your life and how you need to move up and get closer to God. Well, when he's judging his house, the preaching will usually get a little hot. It'll get a little close. He's trying to expose some things. It's amazing. I've heard from quite a few of you. Encouraging things. Thanking me for messages and thanking for live stream in, in this difficult time. Some churches only doing it once a week. We're doing it at the same time as we always have service. Uh, folks have been uh, just very kind. I'm amazed at how many folks have reached out to us and who's reached out to us, but I'm equally amazed at those that haven't reached out to us. And then I came across this quote today. One preacher said this. He said, If our church members aren't calling us in tears asking to have access to the church for prayer, 
What makes us think the world is going to call us in tears seeking salvation and hope? See, God's exposing us. We're whining and complaining because we can't do everything we can't, don't normally do and we can't come to church. When we get to the point where we're whining and complaining to God that sinners are dying and going to hell and God, you've got to do something to save them, then business will pick up. But see, we, we, we're not having folks call and say, Preacher, is there a time you can leave the church unlocked so we can come in and pray? Now, I do know folks have been going down to the rock altar and praying. That's a real blessing. But I haven't had an onslaught of people saying, Preacher, when, when can I sneak over to church and nail something down on the altar? See, God's exposing. He's exposing. He's publishing what's really going on in our hearts. He's pruning. He's purging. And God, when He judges His house, He also proves some things. In Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 13, the Bible says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid, neither do men light a candle, put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and give it light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now the Lord Jesus gave this command in the midst of the great Sermon on the Mount. There's two things that he told God's people what they were. He said, your salt and your light. Your salt and your light. He judges to prove us. What kind of salt are we? And what kind of light are we? He said, if the salt's lost its savor, where we shall be salted, it's thenceforth good for nothing. The reason God's judging is some of our salt has lost its savor. He said, if you're light of the world, men don't uh, 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 light a candle and put a bushel over it. No, it's of no benefit then. But some of you aren't letting your little light shine, as the little children used to say. Can I say, salt deals with our physical life. We're to impact others physically with our speech. We're to tell others what Jesus means to us. We're being the salt that we're supposed to be. We impact others by our steps, our walk with God. People should know that you're Christian by your lifestyle, by your walk, where you go, and how, how you conduct yourself. They ought to see that in you. You're physically impacting them when they listen to you and they look at you. What can I say? It also stands for our, how we impact people with our stand. We can be like what Ryan Priebus said, that feel-good crowd doesn't really do anything. Or they do know there's a difference from the crowd that stands on the Bible. Folks ought to know whose you are by your stand on the Scripture. Oh, no, I don't go to those places. Why not? Because the Bible says to abstain from all appearance of evil. Oh, no, I don't do that. Why? Because the Bible says don't to let any corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Oh, I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't. They ought to know us by our salt life, by our speech, by our steps, and by our stand. Light deals with our spiritual life. We're to be reflection of God. There are certain things they ought to see reflected in our life that came from God. Can I say they ought to see the reflection of His wonder in our life. Uh, uh, his mercy and His grace in our life ought to be reflected to them. Not I, but Christ that liveth in me. They ought to see that we are different uh, and it ought to be attributed to the grace of God, the mercy of God, the wonder of God, uh, especially when you get to testify and tell what gutter He found you in, uh, what you used to be, uh, but you're not that anymore. What changed? He changed me. Uh, 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 they ought to see the wonder of God his grace and mercy. It ought to reflect God's will. The will of God is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, and they ought to see the light of God reflected in us that we love sinners and want to see sinners saved. And it also ought to be reflected in his workmanship. Ephesians 2.10 tells us that we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? Uh, 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 that workmanship shows the changed life. I'm not what I used to be. I may not always be what I should be, but I'm not what I used to be. What happened to you? Jesus. That would see a changed life in us. That's the light. 
when we're salt and when we're light, then the world knows whose we are. But when the salt's lost its savor and the light begins to dim, judgment must come into our lives so that we once again are being proved that we are what we say we are. Because if you're a Christian, you don't have salt and light, you know what you are? You're a hypocrite. You're not what you say you are. But when you have salt and light, then, my dear friends, you're truly Christ-like. He proves us. Are you what you say you are? I could tell you I can dunk a basketball. You give me a ball and put me on a 10-foot rim, it's not going to happen. You put me on one of them little kid rims, I can do it. But you put me on a 10-foot, it's not happening. So I lied to you. I'm not what I say I am. Well, God's just making us prove what we really are. And sometimes we need to be reminded that our globes need to be cleaned up so our light shines a little better. We need to get the salt back in our life so we can savor our lifestyle. I got to thinking about this. Not only through his judgment will he purge and prune and publish and prove, but God also judges his house, the house of God, through punishing. A lot of what we're going through right now is because we've taken for granted the things of God. Christianity as a whole has become very milk toast. We went through the motion so long it became normal. And so judgment must begin at the house of God. Nowhere do I ever find judgment to be a happy place. That's why you'll never hear Joel Olstein ever preach on it. Judgment means punishing. And can I say, God punishes his children, first of all, through conviction. The hope of this message is that it will convict us to be what we should have been all along. God uses conviction to woo our hearts and bring us back to the center of his will. God never sends conviction when you're in the center of his will, only when you've stepped outside of it. God punishes through conviction. Then he punishes through chastisement. He said if you're without chastisement, you're a bastard, not a son. God chastens his children. He don't chase the devil's children. He chases his children. Some might have had a little faithful problem, so God just shut off church in their life altogether until they get ready to really put their heart in it. And then he'll open it back up. He chastens his children. He punishes through conviction, through chastisement. He punishes through conferring Ichabod, through departing. There's some churches that haven't been doing anything for God for a long time, so he, he, he's going to depart from them. And they open back up. They'll go back to doing whatever they're doing, but God won't be in a part of it. He confers Ichabod, punishes, says, that's it. Reprobate silver, worthless. I'll go on down the road where I'm wanted. Can I say he punishes as well through coffins. If people won't get right with God, they ignore conviction, they ignore chastisement, and they continue running away from the things of God, continue living their life instead of the life he desires for them, God will put them in the grave. said that in 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5, to deliver such and one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God will only allow somebody to shame his name so long, and God will put them in the grave. He'll destroy the flesh that their soul might be saved. And they'll lose all their rewards in heaven because they chose a worldly lifestyle instead of the lifestyle of godliness. And then I thought about this lastly. God uses judgment to bring about revival through planting. What we can't see, because we can't see anybody, there's nobody around. But what we can't see is what God's doing in the hearts of people. For such a time as this, God has deemed this as a means of judgment to accomplish his desires. I thought about this. He's planting seeds of faith in sinners. We've said for years, 
I can't imagine living in this wicked world without Jesus. People have ran their lives out of course for years, but now all of a sudden, when they're afraid to go outside their home, they get to thinking about eternity, get to thinking about death, they're hearing about it every day. And God's starting to plant some seeds in their hearts. Can't wait till we get to go back out on visitation. People start getting them tracks. And all of a sudden, maybe instead of just casting them away or throwing them in a garbage can, maybe they'll read them. And that seed that God's put in their heart might start coming to fruition. We might see them walk in the house of God and get saved by the good grace of God. He's planting seeds of faith. We can't see it, but he is. Some of the people you work around, some of the people you know, some of your family whose nerves are shot, they're watching you. And they're seeing something different in you. God is planting seeds of faith. Hopefully they're seeing something different in you. Worst thing they can ever see is you wringing your hands and whining like they're whining. That's what this whole message has been about. He's planting seeds of faith in sinners. I thought about this. He's planting seeds of fortuity in people's lives. That word fortuity is synopsis with a last resort. What else does God have to do to get God's people's attention? The Bible says in Luke chapter 13, Jesus said this, Then he said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it to the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also until I shall dig about and dung it. For if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. John 15 tells us that it is ordained of God that we bring forth much fruit. It is the will of God for His people to have fruit in their life. He said that it, you'll know a tree by the fruit it bears. One thing that Jesus is very dissatisfied with, it is somebody that He has washed in His blood who is not fruitful. He gave His life for us, and the least we can do is bring fruit to His account. He has invested in us, and we ought to do our best to make him understand that we appreciate his investment and that we hope he gets something in return. But there are people that have no fruit in their life. They don't desire fruit. They don't desire the things of God. They're just hit and miss Christians. They're in and out and up and down. They really don't have any fruit to lay at the Savior's feet. This might be their fortuity. This might be their last last opportunity to become fruitful for Christ because just as he said in that parable to his disciples one pleaded let's give them another chance to bring some fruit for he said but if they don't cut it down this might be your last opportunity for God to cut you out friend you better take it to heart he's planting seeds seeds of faith seeds of fortuity but then I'm trusting and praying he's planting seeds of fire. He's creating a fire in God's people shut up in their bones that when we get to come together again, true revival break out. I'm trusting and praying that when that day comes that we come into this place and there's such an overwhelming of a spirit of adoration towards God that we don't have any singing, we don't have any preaching, we just have an outpouring of God's people worshiping God and God inhabiting their praise where he shows up in a way that we can't even conceive of. That's what I'm praying for, that there are seeds of fire being planted in people's hearts that when this thing does bust, we'll see it more powerful than when a dam busts and all the water gushes out. He's planting seeds of fire. I get reports from some of you. Some of you are hungering and thirsting, chomping at the bit to come back. I pray that's your heart tonight. If we're ever going to have revival, judgment had to take place. God will open this thing up when he deems us worthy to have service again. So now it's contingent on us. What are we doing with God? What are we doing in these days? How are we turning our attention to God and our focus to God 
and our faith in God increase. When God sees enough of us hungering for Him like that, we'll see revival. If not, He may shut it down indefinitely. You see, the power over this thing isn't the governor or even the president. It lies within us. And when God sees in us a desire for Him, we'll have Him. So I wonder tonight, what's He seen in your life? What's He seen in my life? Judgment must begin at the house of God. It's began. It is time. How will we respond? How will we answer the call of God? Dear friend, seek Him while He may be found. Start hungering and thirsting for Him. Start putting Him first. Start truly agonizing with Him in prayer. So I said today, find your promise in the Bible and hang on it till the God answers it in your life do something to get God's attention that you are ready to have him and that he has your full attention my dear friends let judgment turn into revival and if so we'll be thanking God one day that we got shut down and had to do some live streams in order for God to infiltrate us like ways we never knew was possible. I hope and trust this is your prayer. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we sure do love you. Thank you for the scriptures. Lord, help us to have the right spirit in this suffering. Help us to be salt and light. And God, as you purge and prune and publish and prove and punish, Lord, we don't like all that. Our flesh hates it. But Lord, if that's necessary for you to plant seeds of fire in our hearts, God, may we truly blaze in your glory. May we be consumed with you like that burning bush was. And may sinners see God in our lives. God, do a work in these days. Lord, we know your promises will not return unto you again void. We know they'll accomplish that which you will. God, we know that, Lord, nothing we do for Christ is ever in vain. But God, we ask that you would do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Would you, through this time of judgment, truly send revival? Will you truly cause our hearts to burn for God again? And God, we'll thank you and praise you for it. God, if somebody watched and was lost, I know it wasn't a message to the sinner, but I pray you'd put seeds of faith in their heart. That God, we'd see them saved. I pray for your church. I pray for your people. You do a tremendous work in their hearts. And God will thank you for it. God, we don't want to see anybody, Lord, pruned away or purged out. But, Lord, if they're hindering the work of God, I pray they'd get right with God. But if they choose not to get right with God, we pray your will would be done. Father, help us these days, and we'll bless you for it. For it's in the holy and wonderful name of Jesus we do ask these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you for tuning in. Please take the message to heart. Please seek God's face. And please keep looking up. He's coming soon. God bless you. And we'll see you next time. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.